Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, it's, I'm Elizabeth. Hi. It's a big privilege to be in dialogue with so many on the um, forefront of understanding how the built environment affects its human inhabitants. Thank you. Uh, I also initially need to thank my um, husband and partner, Matt, who's done the lion's share of the work to get us here today. Um, and also, just so everyone knows, um, if you have any um, complaints about what you see here today, um, they should be directed to him. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I want to um, apologize in advance. I don't like it when people read their presentations, but I have so much that I want to share with you that I hope you'll indulge us um, so we can do it efficiently. Um, Matt and I are mere architects. However, our interest in the effects of the built environment on humans is surely as vested as anyone's, especially from a personal angle. I'll give you the digest now of a potential memoir. I was unusually happy to celebrate my 40th birthday last week because I've been living for some years with a diagnosis of stage 4 terminal breast cancer. Um, prior to that, I was stage 2A, and at that time was shocked to discover that I'd inherited the BRCA1 mutation. Um, it's not necessarily the worst of it, though. <laughs> uh, the first decade of my adulthood, I struggled with an acquired genetic mutation, systemic mastocytosis. Mastocytosis is a rare and curable disease that, when flaring, imparts symptoms ranging from hives to IBS to asthma to hypersensitivity to brain fog and memory loss, with the risk of sudden death from anaphylactic shock. <laughs> and here I am in front of you. Um, mastocytosis is in remission, and I have no evidence of cancer, and we can discuss any details you're interested in later, but one key detail applicable for the well-being of environmentally sensitive people, for the longevity of cancer patients, and for the maintenance of the healthy status of healthy people is the limitation of chronic low-grade stressors running in the background of daily life. The concept of allostatic load can be better described by um, a lot of others in the room, but it's essentially the detrimental accumulation of chronic stress. Here we can see mechanisms by which the load increases. And for the purposes of this discussion, we hope to assume everyone here is up to speed understanding that chronic stress is a superhighway to disease, and once a disease has taken hold, more stress can be lighter fluid on the barbecue. Chronic stress is, of course, correlated with the six le leading causes of death, as possibly um, the gravest threat to life that many of us will face. So <laughs> here's just a small sample of more studies that suggest stress has major implications for the hippocampus, which we've already heard, and um, this is, of course, integral in our experience of the world. In previous conferences, presentations have touched on ways in which the physical form of the built environment has an impact on humans, but our observation is that discussions and research about the physical forms of architecture can be a bit divergent um, especially when influenced by art speak, sometimes succumbing to the architecture world's well-established fetishism habit. So we've observed the majority of both discussion and study is too often very narrowly focused, isolated from the context of location and use, and we understand that this is usually intentional and to a certain extent necessary, but as active practitioners designing new things every day, we are hungry for actionable information. So the parable of the blind men and the elephant is a decent analogy because without that overall view of architecture, disparate studies can be entirely misleading. We implore the new science to step back and look at the larger picture be first before drilling down to specifics. So some of those larger picture items could be the following aspects of architecture, study of which we believe will return information that we as architects can immediately use to inform our design methods and help ensure that they are not only creating a less stressful built environment, but also creating an environment that will contribute to health and wellness. For now, we'll start here with the aspects of orientation and legibility, and ho hopefully that's some of the lowest hanging fruit. We'll firstly define our terms, then take you through a couple of comparative case studies presenting our observations. And um, these are subjects you may or may not recognize. We'll purposefully make no mention of architects' names, as that's often where problems begin. Um, <laughs> lastly, we'll entertain some perhaps new ideas for how neuroscience can be leveraged to analyze and improve the built environment. Orientation, as we consider it here, is the ability to navigate a space based on cues that correspond to internal navigation systems, and the ability to find your way around based on such cues, markers, or distinguishing elements in the built environment. Next, we term legibility as the ease with which a user can understand the conditions of the built environment. The legibility of an architectural work is related to the aspects inherent in its design, which facilitate distinction between one element and the next, or in other words, the experiential clarity of a building and the organization of the built environment. The concepts of orientation and legibility are so intertwined, we'll discuss them almost as a singular concept. So as to the question of how neuroscience for architecture can make immediate impact, a wonderful place to focus may well be in analyzing the buildings that house our collective canaries in the coal mine. 
those who are perhaps more sensitive to the effects of the environment upon their health because their health is more tenuous or already compromised, not to mention the caretakers who accompany them. So we believe there is an extreme urgency in evaluating and ultimately informing the design of healthcare facilities. As architects, we certainly should not be experimenting with this building typology. We need to identify the architectural characteristics that do harm and the ones that provide benefit. So in our case, we've experienced many healthcare facilities during which we've come to understand the tangible stress inherent in the typical standardized designs of hospitals. How scandalous it should be that these places may be countering their own inherent purpose of healing. So here's my world-class hospital, Northwestern University Medical Center, which will assess for orientation and legibility during a visitor's potential initial encounter. When you search for Northwestern on a map, the address you're given is where you see the red pin. Uh, here's an aerial so you get a better sense of the context. Essentially one large building per block it's from an angle. It's a, a one-way street system. So this is the entrance to campus and essentially how you access that front door. This is what you see. And um, you know, there's a canopy and light fixtures at the door which provide some visual cues. But what if you're headed specifically to the children's hospital one block over? As a parent, this is the last place on earth I ever hope to have to go. And if I have the unfortunate occasion to head there, my baseline anxiety is already quite high. Well, here you have a sign providing some legibility, seeming to signal an entrance, but let's say you're driving. You'll need to circle the block if you're hoping to drop passengers off at the entry, or for that matter, the ER. Um, and if the passengers do rationally alight below the big sign for the place, Fortunately, we have a few layers of mobile signage, possibly necessary because the architectural form does not adequately foster orientation. Um, and hopefully these signs will steer us to the front door way back there. But if you're not in a big hurry, you'll be parking in the garage where this is effectively the grand entrance for visitors to the hospital. And this is the view upon entry. The sequence is virtually antithetical to the notion of orientation. I'm not going to take you deeper inside the building, but chances are you can bring your own experiences to mind. Quote, in many modern building complexes, the problem of disorientation is acute. People have no idea where they are, and they experience considerable mental stress as a result, as Professor Alexander noted 40 years ago. So to solve this problem, the newer art of wayfinding has arisen, and wayfinding is, is necessary because the architectural profession appears to no, longer, to no longer begin the exercise of design with any sort of empathic anticipation of the occupant's experience. In our opinion, this speaks volumes to the users of buildings, not only because graphic designers often cannot refrain from over, overcomplication of the wayfinding graphics, but also because the pattern and ordering that our brain desires is frustrated in the search for rationale now in these designs. So here's a simple plan diagram of an optimally rational system of filtering from a major entrance to the deepest realms of a large building or complex of buildings. The sequence of transitions being marked by distinct gateways which are all visible upon entry to the respective realms. This is how nature herself is organized. So how translatable is this into architectural reality? Let's take, for example, Barcelona's Hospital de la Santa Cruz y San Pau, colloquially San Pau, which was designed and built at the turn of the last century. In essence, we have a series of pavilion buildings, each dedicated to a particular medical specialty. I hope you agree the complex achieves the goals um, of orientation and legibility, at least through its highly rational plan. But of course, the hospital is not experienced from the sky. So here's one of the human approaches. The spire at the entry serves as a visual cue from some distance. Its entry is centralized between bilaterally symmetrical wings, which actually angle forward, reinforcing the axis with perspective. Doorways you see are an open passage bringing you directly through the building to this view. And here the bulk of the hospital is laid out before you, each pavilion distinct in its massing, and each pavilion's entry presented in maximum proximity to the user, adorned with distinguishing detailing and coloration, serving as characteristic points of reference. We posit that voids here glazed when contrasted with solid walls signal the notion of passage, and so as you approach these focalizing bays, the route to the building's door almost organically emerges, contributing to the uninterrupted flow that is punctuated with a distinctly marked doorway. The exit route maintains the same high function as you see in this view back toward the highly transparent central bay, central bay of the pronounced main entry building. This organizational coherence, well-defined sequence and volume, and clarity of navigation facilitate an ease of use that we posit minimizes environmentally induced stress. I'd like for you to consider that the importance of designers actively facilitating the user's comprehension of buildings and spaces through architectural forms is not limited to healthcare. We shouldn't be building stress-inducing environments anywhere in the public realm. And the same principles apply across all building types. For example, here's a large governmental building in our neck of the woods. 
You see it exhibits massing, hierarchy, centralized entrances, and point of entry accentuation through form and detail. And this is, of course, what was replaced by this, which is <laughs> Chicago's Federal Center, widely considered a masterpiece ensemble. Um, it includes a post office, an office building, and a courthouse. At street level, there's an ongoing folly of visitors trying to find their destination in this complex and even into the buildings. Is it poor architectural design if our conscious mind is overly occupied with the process of navigation? Can't navigation be delegated to our subconscious mind when visual cues are clear enough to facilitate a state of flow as we move through space? In today's overstimulated information age, do most people need that conscious mind bandwidth for other thinking, or should we accept when architecture piles on? And how do the forms of these buildings impact us? In his book, Words and Rules, Steven Pinker outlines how people think in categories like furniture, veg or furniture, vegetable, and turtle. He says these categories underlie much of our reasoning. We're not dumbfounded every day a new turtle we see by every new turtle we see. We categorize it as a turtle and expect it to have certain traits. This means that beforehand we did not mindlessly record every turtle we had seen. We must have abstracted what turtles have in common. To understand mental categories is to understand much of human reasoning." End quote. Furthermore, we have what he calls prototypes in each category. If someone told you to imagine a bird in a tree outside, you wouldn't think of a penguin. These prototypes that exist in our consciousness are very close to what Carl Jung calls archetypes, and in architecture we similarly refer to them as typologies. So quoting Jung, all the most powerful ideas in history go back to archetypes, for it is the function of consciousness not only to recognize and assimilate the external world through the gateway of the senses, but to translate into visible reality the world within us. As neuroscience contributes more to architecture, there is great value in understanding this concept of prototypes or archetypes. How do we react to archetypological forms, such as the gate, the tower, and the temple, and their inherent legibility and orientation? By contrast, how do we react to the alternative? Images you see here are all award-winning architecture constructed in the last 50 years. Six different buildings, six different building types. Is it easy for you to understand the use of each building? The answer's coming. I'm just kidding. <laughs> They're actually these. <laughs> Obviously. The follow-up question is where in the world do you suppose these buildings exist, which is another aspect we posit is important to this conversation, but hopefully another time. We suspect rampant illegibility is a problem, and especially damaging when combined with systemic disorientation. Even if you, as an enlightened architect or scientist, feel unaffected by a minimization of imbued information in your physical structures, if it is impacting the uninitiated around you, then it is also affecting you, given stress's classification as a contagion. More often than not, large-scale and public architecture is commissioned by a committee, group, or corporation. Rarely does the commissioning group represent the full body of end users, but they pay your bill, so you, they sit in the client seat. This is the point at which the onus falls on the architect to assume the mantle of the other, which is the ability to understand, assimilate, emulate, and deploy the experiences, needs, and emotions of others, particularly as it relates to the design process and in the creation of the built environment. We know that the architect lives in the work before even the first foundation forms are laid. She experiences the building and sees the forms in the mind's eye. However, the consummate designer will not only experience the building as themselves, but will take on the mantle of the other, empathically experiencing the building via a theory of mind of every possible user and of the passerby. It might be observed that contemporary architectural design has downregulated the empathic anticipation of the user's experience, instead favoring differentiation. But what if the big, bold graphic form promoting the individual actually results in harm to others? Users of buildings intuitively, if not explicitly, understand the designer's intention via theory of mind. That this phenomenon, through this phenomenon, the designer and user have an interaction on an intangible but not immeasurable level that is not limited by time or astral plane, but embodied in place and in space. This latter exchange of cognition um, occurs as the user experiences the space and attempts to understand the intention of the designer, particularly consciously, in novel, unclear, disorienting, inconvenient, or illegible spaces and places. Unfortunately, the intentions of many novel contemporary spaces are increasingly difficult to understand. Given this exchange, what effect does a building have when designed without empathy or even with contempt toward users and passers-by? This is where neuroscience for architecture could have great impact. Discovering the conditions that promote health is clearly a goal. However, we could use some tools to evaluate architectural forms for healthiness. So let's study extant architectural works and elements. If it's damaging, condemn it. If it's beneficial, let's celebrate it. And returning to this list, we posit that these idiomata are not yet sufficiently prioritized in neuroscientific research. 
In order to have a complete conversation and actionable results, these characteristics must be studied further. We hope they can become part of the lexicon of attributes attended to by neuroscientific research going forward, and we want to assist in that effort. So after all, it is possible the inherent legibility and orientation of architecture can not only embody a health-fostering environment, but also ease occupants' cognitive burden, which might even lead to breakthroughs that truly change the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um